Good evening. I'm David Lynn, editor of the Kenyon Review, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Denham Sutcliffe Memorial Lecture, which is the concluding event of our 2017 Literary Festival. Once again, the Lit Fest has been in preparation for many in our community for weeks and months, with book giveaways, public lectures and discussions, movie screenings, and growing anticipation. Yesterday and today, many of you will have participated in writing workshops, public readings, book sales, and panel discussions. And tonight, we will have the pleasure of listening to one of the world's exceptional authors. First, however, I really want to take a moment to thank a few of the people who have labored so long and hard to bring this great festival about. Tori Weber, the Associate Director of Programs for the Kenyon Review, has worked her usual magic along with a great team, including Stella Ryan Lozen, Elizabeth Dark, and Kirsten Reach. Aiding them in countless ways have been the Kenyon Review Associates, too many to name, sadly, but an extraordinary group. Professor Kim McMullen has led several terrific conversations in the community about the works of Colm Tobin. And Anna Duke Reach, KR's Director of Programs, has overseen all with beneficence, vision, and unflagging energy. We are truly grateful for critical annual support to Jim and Susan Finn, Ariel Corporation, the Community Foundation in Mount Vernon and Knox County, the People's Bank of Gambier, Printing Arts Press, the Mount Vernon News, the First, Na First Knox National Bank, and the Ohio Arts Council, uh, which gives you some sense of that this really is a community undertaking. Finally, additional support and collaboration have been provided by the Public Library of Mount Vernon and Knox County, the Kenyon College Bookstore, and Paragraphs Bookstore, and by the Kenyon College English Department. After tonight's presentation, our speaker will be happy to sign books. I'll provide details on how that will happen immediately after the talk. I'd say that Colm Tobin is one of the finest writers in English today, except that isn't quite true, the English part. For he's taken and shaped that tongue into a language and a music that are very much his own. More impressive even than that, he has managed to create a different sound or vocabulary or style or tone for each of his extraordinary novels. I realize that most clearly on reading his latest, House of Names, a retelling of the ancient Greek story of the murder of Agamemnon, and its deadly ripples through the house of Atreus. The language is spare, stark, I'd say Spartan, but that's the wrong tribe. It most assuredly is potent. How different are the melodies in Brooklyn or the Jamesian mellifluences of the master? But in truth, I'm thrilled to read almost anything from Colm Tobin's pen be it his brilliant critical appraisal of the poetry of Elizabeth Bishop or his piece on Catalonian independence in last week's Guardian. For tonight's signing, those who already have books by Colm Tobin should form a line in the aisle directly to my left. Actually, we'll do that after. The, I'll explain this. After the reading, there will be a chance to have your book signed, and I will, I will explain that um, later. Uh, in the meantime, please join me in welcoming Colm Tobin. Thank you, David, and thank you very much for coming out this evening. Um, I spoke the other night um, in New York about what Kenyon College meant for me and for friends of mine um, when I was beginning to read poetry and find my way through the world of 
literary criticism. In 1972, I came from a small town in the southeast of Ireland to University College Dublin. I suppose it was the time of the new criticism, and that sort of close reading. And I suppose the problem, part of the problem we had in Ireland doing this was that some of the gurus of this movement lived in England, and they were I, people like um, I.A. Richards. Um, and um, we, I suppose that there was a concern that we wanted to look the, in the other direction towards the United States. But, but it just may have all, in many ways, so many aspects of Irish culture connect to American culture in very easy ways. But in this way, that um, in the normal way that now you might hear somebody in a lecture talking about the various French theorists, such as Derrida or Deleuze, just then, in those years, 72, 73, 74, the people who were lecturing us would talk in a, would mention in a very casual way what John Crow Ransom had to say about a certain text, or the work of Alan Tate. And those two in particular would have been mentioned along with people like Cleant Brooks and um, Kenneth Burke. And um, so that those books of criticism were in the library but, but it wasn't just that, but the fact that they were poets as well as critics, the fact that they took a sort of very rigorous view of how poetry should be read as much as written. But it wasn't merely rigorous. It took its bearings from elements in Matthew Arnold, elements in T.S. Eliot, that reading of poetry should also be sensuous, and that the essay written about a body of work should be as well written or, uh, and, 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 and as intelligent as possible. And um, a another thing was in the air at the time, which was that Robert Lowell, in these years, had moved from New York to um, England, where he'd married an Irish woman called Caroline Blackwood. And so he was in Dublin quite a lot. And um, one was hearing about, I mean, I never actually met him there, but I knew he was in the city. His books were very well published at that time on our side of the Atlantic. And uh, all of us knew that in 1937, as a young man, he made a move which I think mattered enormously to American poetry and also to Irish poetry, in that he, he came from New England to Kenyon College. And he found, which is it's almost something like out of a dream, that he could come down here not only to work with John Crow Ransom and with Alan Tate, but also that to have as your roommates Peter Taylor and Randall Jarrell. And the work he did, what he learned here about the language of poetry, about how to read poetry, about the tradition, and also about the sheer way that poetry mattered and could matter, um, was to affect, as I said, not only American poetry, but the work of figures in Ireland, such as Seamus Heaney, and Derek Mahan. Um, the, the second thing I want to say is just I want to take a single word. And um, this is some years later where I'm working as a journalist and I interview a writer called Mary Beckett. She wrote two wonderful books about the troubles in Northern Ireland, They're probably the best books on that subject. And uh, I had brought the tape back to the office and I was transcribing it, but there was a word I couldn't understand. And there was nothing wrong with the tape, it was just I simply couldn't understand the word. And um, I asked people to listen to it. She's saying, you just have to thaw. You just have to thaw. And uh, so I, um, I mean, I was curious about, I didn't know what it was, so I called her and said, um, Mary, I have a word, and played it to her, and she said, thaw. I said, yes, I know thaw, Mary, but what? I mean, what does it mean? How do you spell it? She said, well, it's spelled T-H-O-L-E, and um, it means to tolerate suffering. Do you not know the word? And I said, no. I, I, and we, we then worked out that it was a Northern Irish word and not a Southern Irish word, and she was from the North and I was from the South, and that was besides the fact that they had red pillar boxes and we had green ones, they had the word thole and we didn't. 
so I, but I put it in the interview nonetheless without a gloss. I just thought it'd be good for people to see the word. And um, the next time I came across the word is in Seamus Heaney's introduction to his translation of Beowulf. And he's sheepishly approaching this poem of old, uh, you, know, you know, it's old English poem because, of course, he's Irish and wondering what right do I have as an Irish writer to enter into the spirit of what is the sort of one of the foundation texts um, of the neighboring island. Uh, it's, um, if you do it to a smaller place, it's called appropriation. What happens, what's the word if you do it to a much bigger place? And he was, t- was teasing out this, and he was talking about coming across a word, tholian, which, um, because it had a thorn symbol rather than, uh, in the orthography, rather than a th, he, he didn't really, you know, he didn't, he looked at it and looked at it, and then eventually uh, he decided to, pr- as he was working out how to translate it, he wanted to say it. So he realized it was tholian, and realized that it was, a, it was a, the toleration of suffering. And he realized then that an aunt of his had used the word. While in his generation it wouldn't have existed, in the older generation it was there. So it had made its way, it had died in the England of Old English, but it had made its way along some trade route by by virtue of some family or group of travelers or some river into Scotland. It had lurked in Scotland and it had made its way in the plantations across from Scotland to Ulster in Northern Ireland, the Elizabethan and Jacobean plantations at the end of the 16th, early 17th centuries, uh, in the mouths of the Protestant Presbyterian planters who had come into Northern Ireland, Ulster, and uh, slowly then it had made its way by them, through them, into the mouths of the people who would have spoken Gaelic at a certain point, but were learning English. And it would have moved, therefore, Mary Beckett being a Catholic, Seamus Heaney's aunt being a Catholic, into the mouths of people who perhaps, you know, generations before were speaking Gaelic. So it had made all these moves. And uh, the fascinating thing is, where else it moved? Where did this word thol go? And um, you come across it, the only time you find it um, in modern poetry is... um, in a poem by John Crow Ransom called Here Lies a Lady, which goes, Fair ladies, long may you bloom, and sweetly may thole. I noticed that, because he revised his poem so much, he changed, and sweetly may thole, later on to, and toughly may thole, which is, think better, toughly may thole. And that, obviously, it had made its way to America. Um, The Scots coming down into, um, you know, from across the Atlantic down into America, and the word had survived in his ear, in his mouth, in, he he had, that he knew the word, not as a literary word, but uh, but, but because it wasn't a literary word, except in Beowulf, um, it was a word that that just had survived in the, having begun at the very center of things, Beowulf had survived in the peripheries so that it moved, its, it made its way to Ireland and it made its way here and so that we should all have t-shirts saying, you must thole. <laughs> um, I, um, um, I began the novel, Nora Webster, in 2000. Um, I, I didn't finish it for a long time. I couldn't, part of it, the reason was that it was so autobiographical, or at least it was so much it was about what happened in our house in the years after my father died that I didn't quite know. It's, it's often harder to um, deal with direct experience, things that you remember, and try and put shape on them than it is with fiction, that fiction or something you imagine can seem to have its own arc, its own way of moving um, organically into story than th- our lives, which are often random and shapeless. But at this, um, the opening of the book is directly from memory. Um, and what, what happened what, in a small town um, like the one I'm from is that when someone died, people would just come to the house night after night and talk and talk. It's sort of marvelous if you're a little novelist because you can sit and listen to everything they're saying. It was always better sometimes when somebody left the house 
because then they would talk about them when they'd gone, and that would always be more interesting sometimes. Um, anyway, this scene I'm going to read, which is the very opening part of Nora Webster, it, it, it is really from life. It's really o- o- almost an attempt, if you found a f- an old photograph, to, you know, to go down and just, just get the photograph um, framed. You must be fed up of them. Will they never stop coming? Tom O'Connor, Nora's neighbour, stood at his front door and looked at her, waiting for a response. I know, she said. Just don't answer the door, that's what I'd do. Nora closed the garden gate. They, they mean well, people mean well, she said. Night after night? He said, I don't know how you put up with it. Nora wondered if she could get back into the house without having to answer him again. He was using a new tone with her, a tone he would never have tried before. He was speaking as though he had some authority over her. People mean well, she said again, but in saying it this time, it made her feel sad, made her bite her lip to keep the tears back. When she caught Tom O'Connor's eye, she knew that she must have appeared put down, defeated. She went into the house. That night, a knock came to the door at around eight o'clock. There was a fire lighting in the back room and the two boys, her two sons, were doing their homework at the table. You answer it. Donal, one of the boys, said to Connor, the younger guy. No, you do. One of you answer it, she said. Connor, the younger one, went out into the hall. She could hear a voice when he opened the door, a woman's voice, but not one that she recognised. Connor ushered the visitor into the front room. It's the little woman who lives in Court Street, he whispered to her when he he came into the back room. Which little woman? I don't know. May Lacey shook her head sadly when Nora came into the front room. Nora, I waited until now. I can't tell you how sorry I am about Morris. Morris is Nora's husband, who's just died. And so then they start, then they start talking, and then... um, um, May Lacey has all these letters and different things to, um, to discuss. And um, I, mean, I remember the woman that she had, everything was from Brooklyn, about her daughter being in Brooklyn. So um, she's talking about her daughter's husband who was in hospital in Brooklyn. So anyway, May Lacey went on, Tony was in the hospital bed in Brooklyn and didn't this man arrive into the bed beside him and they got talking and Tony knew he was Irish. And he told him his wife was from the county Wexford. She stopped and pursed her lips as though she was trying to remember something. Suddenly she began to imitate a man's voice. Oh, that's where I'm from, the man said. And then Tony said she was from Enniscorthy. That's where I'm from too, the man said. And he asked Tony what part of Enniscorthy she was from. And Tony said she was from Friary Street. May Lacey kept her eyes fixed on Nora's face, forcing her to express interest and surprise. And the man said, that's where I'm from too. Isn't that extraordinary? And so she goes on and starts to talk about her family and um, then says, you'd miss them all when they'd go away. I miss them all, I do, but it's funny of all of them, it's Eileen I think about most. There was something, I don't know, I just didn't want to lose Eileen, who's her daughter. I thought after Rose died, you know all this, Nora, that she would come home and stay and she'd find some sort of job here. And then one day, when she was just back a week or two, I noticed her all quiet. It wasn't like her. She started to cry at the table. And that's when we heard the news that her fellow in New York wouldn't let her come home unless she married him. And she had married him there without telling any of us. <laughs> Well, that's that, Eileen, I said. You'll have to go back to him, so. And I couldn't face her or speak to her. And she sent me photographs of him and her together in New York. But I couldn't look at them. They were the last thing in the world I wanted to see. But I was always sorry she didn't stay. Yes, I was sorry to hear she went back. But maybe she's happy there, Nora said. And immediately wondered as May Lacey looked down sadly, a hurt expression on her face if that was a wrong thing to say. And um, so I had written this as the opening of the book, 
And um, I was always postponing writing more of the book, just, just writing a chapter every so often, leaving it for a while, writing another chapter. And I, 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 I would do anything anyone asked me to get away from the book. And at one stage, someone asked me if I would go to teach in Austin in Texas for a semester. That seemed like a really good way of getting away from the book. And so I agreed I would go. And um, I didn't put any thought into it. I just eventually got a visa and arrived in Austin. And Austin's changed a lot in the last 10 years or so. But I have to say about it that everyone was telling me, you know, what a great place it was. Keep Austin weird. And it was, you know, the center of, of all sorts of activity in America. And, and um, it was better than Dallas or Houston. It was better than everywhere, San Antonio. Or anyway, but I, I, Brendan Behan said about Toronto, um, it, it'll be lovely when they finish it. And I, I felt a bit like that about Austin sometimes. That I wasn't quite sure they'd finished it yet. And I wish they'd asked me later on maybe when it was finished. But anyway, um, I began to be homesick. And um, especially in the mornings when I woke up, I, I thought I'd like to be at home. Things I don't even like about Ireland, like the news. There's a, there's a morning radio program called Morning Ireland, which always has you know, terrible politicians and big ad breaks and a lot of screeching and shrillness. And I don't like that program, but I began to miss it. And Irish bread, there's a certain sort of Irish sliced pan, white sliced bread, you know, that's not very good for you. And I began to miss that too. And even, you know, generally I missed Irish weather, you know, which I don't think anyone's ever really missed, but I missed it. And um, um, when I came home, um, to Ireland, I thought I should just go back and maybe write a book for a change. And I, I just read over the opening, as, as a way of not writing, I thought, well, well I'll revise something, that will be good. And so I read over the opening, what, what I've just read to you now, and I, I saw that story. And it struck me, that story, hold on, she went to America, she came home with the, and didn't tell them that she had got married in America. Because the boy she, or the young man she met in America said he wouldn't let her go home or didn't want her to go home unless she married him. And she didn't tell them. She took off the ring on the boat and she um, eventually told them. And I thought, that's a story. This Nora Webster is not a story. That's a story. So I thought it might make a short story. But then, of course, I thought of bringing her back in the summer when, you know, she could go to the beaches in Ireland, you know, and... Um, I thought of giving her a, you know, a sort of second romance that would match the first one. You know, she already had one in Brooklyn, but what about giving her another one? And so the, slowly the novel grew. It was another way of not writing Nora Webster so that I could write the novel Brooklyn. Um, but I was also using some of that experience of my own. I mean, the reason why it grabbed me in the way it did when I read that section over was that, that just that idea of being away and coming home and thinking about home and thinking about the difference between, you know, imagining home and blundering into going away and then m missing one and never being sure which is the right place to be in. And um, so um, this is um, the girl, um, Eilish, um, I now imagine her, she's, she's made the journey across the Atlantic. She's found a job um, working in a store in Brooklyn, which, which is called Bartocci's. That day, there's been a big sale, a nylon sale. It's the early 1950s in the store. And she's staying, and she's staying in, a, in a boarding house run by a woman called Mrs. Kyo. And there are other lodgers, they're all young women staying there. And she's brought um, Mrs. Kyo back a pair of nylon stockings. Mrs. K oh, yeah, and her sister is called Rose, and her brother is called Jack, who get mentioned in, the, in this. Mrs. Kyo seemed pleased by the pair of stockings and offered to pay for them. But Eilish said they were a gift. That evening during supper, they all talked about Bartocci's famous nylon sale, which always happened without warning. Yet they were amazed when Eilish told them that even she who worked there had no idea when it was going to happen. Well, if you ever hear even a rumour, Diana, who's one of the other lodgers, said, you'll have to let us all know. And the nylon stockings are the best. They don't run as easily as some of the others. They'd sell you garbage, some of those other stores. That's enough now, Mrs. Kyo, who's very severe, said. 
I'm sure all the stores are doing their best. With all the excitement and discussion surrounding the nylon sale, Eilish did not notice until the end of the meal that there were three letters for her. Now, these are her first letters from home. The minute she came back from work every day, she had checked the side table in the kitchen where Mrs. Keogh left letters. She could not believe that she'd forgotten to check this evening. She drank a cup of tea with the others, holding the letters in her hand nervously, feeling her heart beating faster when she thought about them, waiting to go to her room and open them and read the news from home. The letters she knew by the handwriting were from her mother and Rose and Jack, her sister and brother. She decided to read her mother's first and leave Rose's until the end. Her mother's letter was, lo- was, sorry, her mother's letter was short and there was no news in it, just a list of the people who were asking for her with some, of the, some details of where her mother had met them and when. Jack's letter was much the same, but with references to the crossing she had told him about in her letter. And Rose's handwriting, she saw, was very beautiful and clear as usual. She wrote about golf and work and how quiet and dull the town was and how lucky Ailish was to be in the bright lights. In a postscript, she suggested that Ailish might like sometimes to write to her separately about private matters or things that might worry their mother too much. She suggested that Ailish might use her work address for these letters. The letters told Ailish little. There was hardly anything personal in them and nothing that sounded like anyone's own voice. Nonetheless, as she read them over and over, she forgot for a moment where she was and she could picture her mother in the kitchen, taking her Basildon Bond notepaper and her envelopes and setting out to write a proper letter with nothing crossed out. Rose, she thought, might have gone into the dining room to write on paper she'd taken home from work using a longer, more elegant white envelope that her mother had. Elish imagined that Rose, when she was finished, might have left hers on the hall table and her mother would have gone with both letters in the morning to the post office, having to get special stamps for America. She could not imagine where her brother Jack had written his letter, which was briefer than the other two, almost shy in its tone, as though he did not want to put too much in writing. She lay on the bed with the letters beside her. For the past few weeks, she realized she had not really thought of home. The town had come to her in in flashing pictures, but her own life in the town, in Enniscorthy, the town she'd left, the life she'd lost and would never have again, she kept out of her mind. Every day she'd come back to this small room, this town, sorry, this small room, this house, of sounds and had gone over everything new that had happened. Now all that seemed like nothing compared to the picture she had of home, of her own room, the house in Friary Street, the food she had eaten there, the clothes she wore, how quiet everything was. All this came to her like a terrible weight and she felt for a second that she was going to cry. It was as though an ache in her chest was trying to force tears down her cheeks despite her enormous effort to keep them back. She did not give in to whatever it was. She kept thinking, attempting to work out what was causing this new feeling that was like despondency. That was like how she felt when her father died and she watched them closing the coffin. The feeling that he would never see the world again and she would never be able to talk to him again. She was nobody here. It was not just that she had no friends and family. It was rather that she was a ghost in this room in the streets on the way to work on the shop floor. Nothing meant anything. The rooms in the house on Friary Street belonged to her, she thought. When she moved in them, she was really there. In the town, if she walked to the shop or to the vocational school, the air, the light, the ground, it was all solid and part of her, even if she met no one familiar. Nothing here was part of her. It was false, empty, she thought. She closed her eyes and tried to think, as she had done so many times in her life, of something she was looking forward to. But it was nothing, not the slightest thing, not even Sunday, nothing maybe except sleep. And she was not even certain that she was looking forward to sleep. In any case, she could not sleep yet, since it was not yet nine o'clock. There was nothing she could do. It was as though she had been locked away. And... Obviously for her, the first Christmas away from home is going to be vital. It's going to be a really difficult time because the time when normally the family would gather in Ireland. And um, so um, 
the priest who's sort of looking after her, who's a sort of guardian, realizes the best thing for her to do on Christmas Day is to go and work, is actually to go and, and work in the kitchen uh, for these men and some women, but mainly men, who have nowhere else to go on Christmas Day. They're people of Irish extraction. And they come to the parish hall on Christmas Day where they're fed sort of turkey. Um, they say turkey and ham and Brussels sprouts like you do them in Ireland, meaning you, you boil them far too much in Ireland. And, uh, and so they get an Irish Christmas dinner together. And um, so that's where she goes um, on Christmas Day. Uh, and a funny thing has happened to her that, that just as the people are coming in, she starts watching them and a man comes in and for a second, full second, she thinks it's her father. But her father's dead and she's so far away, it's an impossible thing. But just because these Irish faces are coming in and she's seeing them, you know, the illusion is created. And then she finds this man is talking Irish, not English, to somebody else. And she notices him later on. And um, she's working with two women who are from the town of Arklow called Miss Murphy. And so they're all feeding and, you know, feeding everyone, giving trifle and, as I say, overcooked Brussels sprouts and turkey. Um, by the time they were removing the trifle dishes, the hall was a mass of smoke and animated talk. Men sat in groups with one or two standing behind them. Others moved from group to group, some with bottles of whiskey and brown paper bags that they passed around. When all the cleaning of the kitchen and the filling of garbage cans had been completed, Father Flood, who's the priest, suggested that they go into the hall and join the men for a drink. Some visitors had arrived, including a few women, and Alice thought as she sat down with a glass of sherry in her hand that it could have been a parish hall anywhere in Ireland on the night of a concert or a wedding when the young people were all elsewhere dancing or standing at the bar. After a while, Elish noticed that two young men had taken out, that two men had taken out fiddles and another a small accordion. They had found a corner and were playing as a few others stood around and listened. Father Flood was moving about the hall with a notebook now, writing down names and addresses and nodding as old men spoke to him. After a while, he clapped his hands and called for silence. But it took a few minutes before he could get everyone's attention. I, I don't want to interrupt the proceedings, he said, but we'd like to thank a nice girl from Enniscorthy and two nice women from Arklow for their hard day's work. There was a round of applause. As a way of thanking them, there's one great singer in this hall, and we're delighted to see him this year again. He pointed to the man whom Ailish had mistaken for her father. He was sitting away from Ailish and Father Flood, but he stood up when his name was called and walked quietly towards them. He stood with his back to the wall so that everyone could see him. When Ailish looked up, the man was signaling to her. He wanted her, it seemed, to come and stand with him. It struck her for a second that he might want her to sing, so she shook her head, but he kept beckoning and people began to turn and look at her. She felt she had no choice but to leave her seat and approach him. She could not think why he wanted her. As she came close, she saw how bad his teeth were. He did not greet her or acknowledge her arrival, but closed his eyes and reached his hand towards hers and held it. The skin on the palm of his hand was soft. He gripped her hand tightly and began to move it in a faint circular motion as he started to sing. His voice was loud and strong and nasal. The Irish he sang in, she thought, must be Connemara Irish, because she remembered one teacher from Galway in the Mercy Convent who had that accent. He pronounced each word carefully and slowly, building up a wildness, a ferocity in the way he treated the melody. It was only when he came to the chorus, however, that she understood the words. And he glanced at her proudly, almost possessively, as he sang these lines. All the people in the hall watched him silently. There were five or six verses. He sang the words out with pure innocence and charm so that at times when he closed his eyes, leaning his large frame against the wall, he did not seem like an old man at all. The strength of his voice and the confidence of his performance had taken over, 
and then each time he came to the chorus, he looked at her, letting the melody become sweeter by slowing down the pace, putting his head down then, managing to suggest even more that he had not merely learned the song, but that he meant it. Eilish knew how sorry this man was going to be and how sorry she would be when the song had ended, when the last chorus had to be sung and the singer would have to bow to the crowd and go back to his place and give way to another singer as Eilish too went back and sat in her chair. As the night wore on, some of the men fell asleep or had to be helped to the toilet. The two Miss Murphys made pots of tea and there was Christmas cake. Once the singing ended, some of the men found their coats and came to thank Father Flood and the Miss Murphys and Eilish, wishing them a happy Christmas before setting out into the night. When most of the men had left and several who remained seemed to be very drunk, Father Flood told Eilish that she could go if she wanted and he would ask the Miss Murphys to accompany her to Mrs Keogh's house. And she said no, she was used to walking home alone and it would in any case, she said, be a quiet night. She shook hands with the two Miss Murphys and with Father Flood and wished, wished each of them a happy Christmas before she set out to walk through the dark, empty streets of Brooklyn. She would, she thought, go straight to her room and avoid the kitchen. She wanted to lie on the bed and go over everything that had happened before falling asleep. And um, w- one of the things that happened, I mean, just that, that gave me the idea for that was that um, the, uh, the, uh, the strongest tradition, I mean, for traditional singing or traditional playing of music came from the west of Ireland, came from a line that you could draw going down from Donegal in the north and um, through Galway, through Clare, into Kerry, into West Cork. And of course, they were also the poorer places where the language had survived, where Irish had survived, but where many other traditions had survived. And because they were the poorer places, of course, they were the places from where people emigrated. And people arrived in New York um, looking for work, but people also arrived in New York who, the same people looking for work, also knew thousands of songs or could play the fiddle you know, in, in, in a way which is very special, or the accordion, or some other instrument. And um, there, there's, there's a famous example of a man um, called Joe Heaney, or in Gaelic, in Irish, Joseph O'Haney. And he, he really did know thousands of songs, and he had the most beautiful voice of anyone of his generation. But eventually, he just couldn't make a living, so he went to New York. And he was found a job as a doorman in a building in New York. And eventually, some years later, um, these people from New York arrived in a pub in Dublin, which is a famous pub for traditional music. And they saw his photograph on the wall. And they said, that's Joe, that's our doorman. And people said, no, that's Joe, he's our singer. And uh, those two worlds met each other in New York. But one of the ways that they met each other was that, um, especially in the 1920s, um, that people could start making recordings in New York, which they really couldn't do. I mean, there was no recording studio in that line I've drawn on the, on the west of Ireland. So that, but people, you could rent, in the, you know, you could rent in that for an hour a recording studio in, in New York. And so we, we have recordings of our traditional music that otherwise would certainly not have been recorded. And those same recordings helped nourish the revival of our traditional music in the 1960s that had been made in New York. And I love the image of, you know, two Irishmen with coats on them, one with a fiddle, waiting while a few jazz players finished up with their hour of recording while waiting for it's our hour to come on now and do our music. Um, so it was just what gave me the idea for this man who, you know, who, who had nowhere else to go on a Christmas day, but yet could sing the song in that very special way. The problem, of course, was that I still hadn't written any more of this novel, Nora Webster. And, um, you know, eventually I thought that I should really d- do something urgent about it. And the best way of doing something urgent about a novel is to write it. You know, there isn't really any other way. I'd done all the other things, postponing it, you know, thinking, oh, I need another year. And then just, no, no, just, just why don't you just write the book? Let's just stop all that nonsense. Um, and then I made up all sorts of problems. One of the problems being that um, this novel is meant to be set between about 1967 and 1972, but I felt it was really old-fashioned. And I felt that, you know, you know all the things we associate with the 60s, 
you know, when people talk about drugs and sex and rock and roll and things like that, well, I, they weren't really in my book. And then I thought, well, they weren't really in the town either. I mean, there were, there were, there were some, I mean, there were drugs in, in the shape of alcohol. People went and drank a bit of alcohol. But like as regards pot or any of those things, no, there was no, none of that in the town. I'm absolutely sure there was no LSD other than, I mean, I mean money, but not any other form of drug. Um, oh, people smoked tobacco. And um, sex. There was some sex. I mean, sex, um, I think, was often happened, or sometimes, between married people in the dark. <laughs> and uh, no, there was no rock and roll. I mean, you, you could get a radio station called Radio Luxembourg if you wanted rock and roll, but that's how far away it was. It was Luxembourg. You had to go for rock and roll, you know. So... I thought I'd better put something in, you know, uh, I mean, you know, just something. I mean, and there were no miniskirts. Um, so I remembered that something had happened in the town that really was like the 60s. Or maybe it was that in one season, a lot of women in the town who had grey hair went down to the hairdressers and got their hair dyed. And so in one month or two months, I don't know, hundreds of women in this small town just came out copper with copper hair or blue hair or, or black, all sorts of new hair. And you'd go to a friend's house and his mother would come to the door and it would be like autumn had come or the fall because she had just gone russet. And you'd look at her and say, you know, it would be the most shocking thing. And um, so I thought maybe that was how the 60s came to our town. This is Nora Webster, who's, you know, who's, who's been made a widow. She's the same woman as that early part of the book I read at the very beginning. Her sons are still called, they're going to appear at the end, and they're called Donal and Connor. On Wednesday morning, she went downtown and had her hair done, talking to Bernie and the hairdressers about a new system of dyeing hair that she'd read about, wondering if it was time that she did something about the grey. I wouldn't like it blue, she said. I know what you mean, Bernie replied. And if it was too black, then it would look dyed. And I was never blonde. Everyone in the town knows I was never blonde. It's a good brown, so it might not look dyed. I could try this one. Bernie showed her a package with a photograph of a woman with curly brown hair that looked natural. Maybe just start off with a small bit, she said. A small bit would wash out in, in, um, in a few days. The instructions say you have to use the whole thing. I've used it before. It's very popular. You, you would be surprised who has it. <laughs> well, try it so, Nora said. Once the dye had been applied, Bernie put a nylon net on her head and left her to flick through some magazines. When she saw that she would not be home in time to cook a proper dinner, at this time, it being the 60s, people still had dinner in the middle of the day in this town. Um, for the boys, she regretted having come here at all. She signaled to Bernie, who was now busy with two women who had come in together and appeared to need to consult each other about each clip of the scissors. I'll be right with you, Bernie said. When she came over to remove the net, Bernie told her not to worry or look too closely, as the real change would come only once the dryer and a brush and comb were used. Nora was aware that the two women Bernie had been looking after were studying her closely. Nora wondered if she should not have consulted other women before getting her hair dyed for the first time, but she couldn't think of anyone she could have asked. Both of her sisters, she presumed, dyed their hair, but she'd never heard them talking about it. Slowly, as she watched Bernie working with a hairdryer, she realised that she was been given the hairstyle of a much younger woman and that the women watching it all happen knew that, and were taking it in with considerable satisfaction. The more Bernie worked, the more her hair seemed to look like a wig. She knew that the dye would take time to wash out, but in the mirror she could see how pleased Bernie was with her own work, and there would be no point in complaining. Is, 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 it, is it not a bit young for me? She asked. I think you look great, Bernie replied. This, this cut is very fashionable at the moment. 
I've never had a fashionable cut before, she said. When it was finished, she knew that anyone who saw her on the way home would think she had lost her mind. <laughs> or that she was trying to look like a young woman rather than someone who was recently widowed. It'll take a few days to get used to, Bernie said, but no one has grey hair anymore. Does the dye not look very unnatural? In a few days, it will lose that look and people will think you've had it all your life. You look very worried, but I promise you that by the weekend, you'll be delighted with it. Y you can't wash it out, can you? No, but it will fade, and I guarantee that you'll be back here in a month for the same again. I've never known anyone to return to the grey. But maybe the next time we'll think of putting some highlights in. They're all the rage now as well. Highlights? Oh, oh I, I don't think so. Outside, she lifted her head high and hoped that all the women in Court Street and John Street would be busy cooking and that none of them would be standing at the door. She prayed that she would meet no one she knew. In her mind, she went through the worst possible encounters, the people she, who would most deplore the idea that with her husband six months in the grave, she had dyed her hair a colour it had never been before. She thought of Jim, her brother-in-law, and knew that she would have to face him and Margaret, her sister-in-law, within a week. They would not know what to think. As she saw Mrs. Hogan from John Street walking towards her, Nora could not tell whether Mrs. Hogan simply did not recognise her or if she wanted to get by her without making any comment. Just as Mrs. Hogan approached her, she seemed almost to jump. Her face quivered and then she stopped. Well, that will take some getting used to, she said. Nora tried to smile. Was it Bernie? Mrs. Hogan asked. Nora, Nora nodded. I heard she got some new packets in all right. God, I must go to her myself. Huh. If Mrs. Kyo, in her apron and a pair of very worn-looking shoes, felt she had the right to comment on Nora's hair, then there was Nora felt no reason why she could not comment in reply. Well, you know where she is. She said dryly, looking at Mrs. Hogan's hair, clearly suggesting that it could benefit from some treatment. It took Mrs. Hogan a moment to take in the possibility that she was being insulted. When she arrived home, she boiled some potatoes and opened a tin of peas and put three lamb chops on the pan. When the boys arrived, her two sons um, from school, um, from, um, the, the boys are aged about um, eight and twelve, that sort of age. The potatoes were not ready. She waited upstairs, calling down to let them know that their dinner would be a bit late. She sat in front of the mirror at the dressing table and tried to work out if there was anything she could do to her hair to make it look more normal. She wished she had told Bernie not to use the lacquer, which was sticky and had a sweet smell. As soon as the boys saw her, they both became quiet. Dona looked away while Connor moved towards her. He reached up and touched her hair. It's all hard, he said. Where did you get it? <laughs> I had my hair done this morning, she said. Do you like it? What's under there? <laughs> under what? Uh, uh, under what you have on your head? What I have on my head is my hair. I, I hope you're not thinking of going out anywhere with that, she said. Donald, the other boy, just glanced at her and then looked away. Um, so eventually she gets a job um, and um, she, has real, she has real problems um, in the workplace and um, that there's this woman um, who she knew before and doesn't, just doesn't like her and it's turned out to be her boss and keeps shouting at her. And so one day um, they begin to have an argument and she finds that she's got a pair of scissors in her hand and she's almost stabbed the woman. And she finds herself out on the street as the morning and um, she um, um, really doesn't know where to go because she doesn't really want to go home and she has a, still has an old, the old car and she's driven to work that day. So she thinks she'll go to 
10 miles away where the coast is um, and just take a walk along the strand, along the beach. Um, th th that beach um, is there in County Wexford, where I'm from, and um, th there's still, even to this day, a convent belonging to the nuns, uh, the Sisters of St. John of God. It's a sort of retreat house in a place called Ballyvalu. And it was very exciting when we were growing up because they were, um, you know, you would be playing, making sand castles or doing those sort of things you're meant to be doing um, on, on, the, on the sand. And suddenly a nun would appear. Now, I know this is after Vatican II and all that, but they would be in their full either black habits or white habits with lots of rosary beads and all sorts of things. They were always wearing glasses as well, nuns. And um, I don't know why that should be. And... Um, uh, anyway, it, it would, it would, you, you would shout up, Mammy, Mammy, look, a nun! And often there'd be two nuns. And it, it, it would seem as though they'd come actually out of the deep, you know, they'd come out of the sea, rather than out of the anywhere else, you know. And they, it was so exotic looking. as they, I suppose they were praying. I must give them their due. They were probably just praying. But they'd walk along slowly by you, nuns. And um, I suppose we also were slightly afraid of nuns. You didn't know if a nun caught you doing something wrong or something, you know. Anyway, nuns. Um, and um, so she goes down to the beach and she walks along. Um, she's also um, suffering really badly from insomnia. And she's been suffering... Um, um, anyway, she, she stops in the village called Blackwater, which is the village just before where she's going to go now. She stopped in Blackwater and bought a packet of 10 Carol cigarettes and a box of matches. She'd not smoked for years and promised herself that she would not smoke all of these cigarettes either, just two or three, before throwing the packet away. When she inhaled, she felt dizzy and that made her remember how tired she was. She threw the cigarettes out of, the, uh, she, she threw the cigarette, that single cigarette, out of the window and then put her head back and fell asleep. When she woke, she spotted a woman standing on the bridge looking over at her car. As the woman approached, she started the engine. She'd not expected to find a haze over the water. She sat in the car in front of Keating's house and looked down in the direction of Rosslare, taking in the heavy milky light that lay over the strand going towards Curriclough and Raven Point. When she got out of the car, she felt how unusually close and humid it was, as if there was thunder coming. She put on a pair of flat shoes that she kept in the car. There were no other cars in the car park. She walked carefully on the stony stretch between the grass and the river, and crossed the small wooden bridge and made her way south. In all the years, she thought she'd never come here, even as late in the season as October. She imagined now how strange it would be in December and January, how, how storm-swept and wintry and how biting the cold. There was hardly any colour. The world in front of her had been washed down. If she moved nearer to the shore, she could look at the small stones that made a rattling sound when the waves broke over them. She saw how exact the colour of each stone was, and it allowed her to forget work and stop worrying about what she would do. She could barely see ahead of her as she walked. It might have been easy to imagine that this was a place that belonged more to Morris, who is her husband who has died, than to her. It was the world filled with absences. There was merely the hushed sound of the water and stray cries of seabirds flying close to the surface of the calm sea. She could make out the sun as it glowed through the curtain of haze. It was unlikely that Morris was anywhere except buried in the graveyard where she'd left him. But nonetheless, the idea lingered that if he or his spirit were anywhere in the world, then he would be here. She thought it almost natural that if his spirit were on this stretch of strand, he would have his own concerns. The details of her life, her job, or what might happen in the future with the children, these would be matters that would seem as vague to him as the far distance did now to her things that would pass as his life had passed. What had happened in the days before his death, the blockage in his system that caused him to cry out so his voice could be heard through the small hospital. This will be with him now more than anything else. It came to her again, his death. 
She pictured those who were there, Jim and Margaret, his brother and sister, and the nun, Sister Thomas, from the convent of St. John of God, who had said special prayers. For the last two days, Nora herself had stayed by his bedside, but he was already far away from them, so far that they might have been like shadows, people already lost to him. Maybe he could only imagine them all as vague presences, the ones he had loved. But love hardly mattered then, just as the haze here now meant that the line between things hardly mattered. As she reached Ballyvaloo and the luminous grey whiteness was moved down the strand by the mild wind towards Curl Clow, she saw that there was a single nun walking back toward, towards the lane that led to the retreat house of the Sisters of St. John of God. Wearing a full black habit, she walked slowly and with difficulty. Nor thought she must be one of the retired nuns who often came here on holiday or on retreat. And she was closer. She saw that the nun was Sister Thomas. who was the nun who had been at her husband's bed when he was dying. Nora was surprised that she was in Ballyvaloo. She had not known that she ever spent time away from her own convent in the town. She moved towards her, and when she reached her, Sister Thomas greeted her and put out her hands and took both of Nora's hands and held them. Suddenly, Nora felt cold and began to shiver. She could hear a wind blowing, almost whistling in the distance. But when she looked down out of the sea and down at the strand, it all seemed calm. There was no sign of the haze lifting. You shouldn't be here on your own, Sister Thomas said. I was in black water this morning to see a friend. And just a while ago, she saw you fast asleep in the car and then driving towards the strand, and she phoned me in the convent because she was worried and wanted to know what she should do. So I walked down here in case I would find you. Who saw me? Nora asked. I thought I would come down to the shoreline to see if you were here, Sister Thomas said quietly. I don't often leave the retreat house. Today it's more like heaven than earth down here. I saw that woman, all right, Nora said, someone who can't mind her own business. That is one way of putting it, someone who's looking out for you. Sister Thomas released Nora's hands. I was not surprised to see you down here, she said. It was meant to happen, us meeting like this. This is how the Lord works. Don't tell me how the Lord works. Nora said, don't tell me that again. When Morris was dying, Sister Thomas said, I asked the Lord to make it easy for him and for you. I have no needs of my own, and I had not asked him for anything in a long time, but I asked him for that, and he denied me what I asked. There must have been a reason for saying no, and the reason is hidden from us. But I know that he is watching over you, and maybe that is why we met, so I could tell you that. He has not been watching over me, Nora said. No one has been watching over me. I knew when I woke today, Sister Thomas said, and said my prayers this morning, that I was to see you. Nora was silent. So turn back now, before the fog comes down so hard that you won't be able to drive home, Sister Thomas said. Go home. Well, the boys will be home soon. The boys will be home from school waiting for you. I can't work in that place anymore. She shouts at me. She said things today that made it impossible for me to stay. It will be all right. It is a small town and it will guard you. Go back to it now. and Stop grieving, Nora. The time for that is over. Do you hear me? I felt as I walked down here Nora began. We all feel that on days like this, Sister Thomas interrupted, and even on other days. It is why we come here. Those who have passed on have it for shelter on their way elsewhere. It's nice to be among them on a day like this. Among them? What? What do you mean? We walk among them sometimes, the ones who have left us. They are filled with something that none of us knows yet. It is a mystery. She held Nora's two hands again and then turned and walked slowly, as though in pain, 
back towards the dunes and the lane leading to, to the retreat house. Nora waited to see if she would look back, but she did not. So Nora stood for a while without moving, looking out at the sea still covered in haze. And then she began to make her way along the strand <coughs> towards <coughs> where she'd left the car. <coughs> the scissors were on the front passenger seat beside the packet of cigarettes. She put the cigarettes in the glove compartment, but took the scissors out of the car and left them down in the gravel for someone else to find. Thank you very much.